Thank you, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here in person, physically. This is uh, very emotional. I haven't spoken to so many people at once in, in what, a year and a half, like most of you. Um, so this is, uh, this is really, and I was not expecting this weather in, in the Netherlands, so it's also a great pleasure. In, in Liege, it's raining. Um, okay, thank you for the introduction, Ingmar, and for the invitation. I'll be telling you uh, two stories about recent work we've just submitted in my, in my group on uh, spectroscopy and transport in 2D materials. And to start some motivation, shouldn't move too far from my computer. Um, think back to this summer has been a spectacular demonstration of the consequences of climate change and uh, the impact on the environment that, that we're having. Um, my home city was destroyed while I was on vacation. The downtown was, uh, was flooded to an impressive extent. Um, and at the same time, on the other side of the planet in California, they've had record burns that they have not seen ever. So this is the biggest flood in Belgium in 100 years. This is the biggest fire ever in the entire United States. Um, clearly, we, we have problems and we have something to do about it. This, this whole issue of sustainability is, is driving most of the interest that governments and, and industries can have in the research that we're doing at this stage. We're stuck in a kind of vice. The whole of humanity, but the whole Earth is stuck between what I've dubbed here very simplistically CO2 and growth. Growth means economic growth, population growth, technological growth. And CO2 is a, a very shorthand for a number of different things that we're doing to the environment, which have to be maintained, which have to be somehow contained and, and compensated for. Um, most of this is not really on our shoulders and will be dealt with through uh, political, social, economic means, which are our responsibilities personally, but not as a community of, of scientists. But uh, society and politicians in particular seem to have extremely high hopes for what we can pull together in the coming decade or two um, in terms of technological breakthroughs to answer at least some of the challenges which are coming true uh, due to, to climate change and a number of associated challenges in biodiversity and, and habitat destruction. Um, in particular, energy materials have been booming for 10, 20 years with this uh, very perspective, energy production, but also energy storage. Um, but there are many, many ancillary uh, fields and basically no field is immune. Even if we were to take all the big producers of CO2 and zero them, there would still be too much. We would, we're, we're going to have to attack every last little field in terms of energy efficiency, energy recovery, and this includes lighting, transport, construction, and so on. And the one I'm going to focus on today is in electronics and IT. Um, 20 to 30 percent of the world's total electric consumption or production will be consumed by electronics within the next five years. So that's more you know, than heating and uh, electric cars and, and all these other things. Um, it's, it's immense. And all of these challenges I've just listed here go through some form of new material. The materials of yesterday have proven known limits which we're going to have to break through. New materials and new paradigms, ways of using existing materials, but in, in different ways. OK, so how are we going to fix IT, electronics? There are two main paradigms in this, uh, in this new field, which have evolved over the past, again, 10, 20, 30 years. And the first one is just to do the same thing, but compute better. Better means with less power. It means faster, more efficiently. And the two fields that I want to focus on in particular are nanoelectronics, so miniaturizing more efficiently the, uh, the electronics that we do today. This also implies new materials. I'll go that, into that a little bit later. And the other is what I dub spintronics. And so there are, there are many different tronics here, but I've, I've simplified to just cite a few. Um, and in spintronics, instead of using the displacement of charge, which you know due to Ohm's law creates heat and dissipates energy, you could imagine moving energy instead of uh, and uh, information through the magnetic degrees of freedom of individual electrons instead of moving the charge itself. This is intrinsically a much less energetic process and it's much more efficient in terms of energy treatment. So this is an example with, uh, with little skirmions that are created in a magnetic layer on top of iridium. And this is a, a paper we published beginning of the year showing that you can really reach with 2D materials an extreme limit of, uh, of cleanliness 
and uh, pristine transport through these materials, which attains basically the same values as we predict in, in theory. The other branch, the other paradigm, is to compute differently with a different concept. That doesn't necessarily mean that it will always be more efficient than this branch, but it allows you to do very different things. And the two main examples for this are quantum computing and neuromorphic computing. So quantum computing uses uh, a parallel calculation of many, many different states at once through the preparation of a quantum state instead of a classical state, which is simply a, a classical bit, which is one or zero. Neuromorphic computing mimics the brain in having a memory which is Im embedded within the calculation device in such a way that the state of the calculation device, instead of having to refer to memory, which is external to the, the CPU or the brain, um, it, it, everything is embedded at, at the same place. And this locality has advantages in terms of energy, in terms of efficiency. Okay. So we have to find materials. We have a number of different paradigms, which may, raises different challenges for different types of materials. And I want to show you a very uh, broad sketch of how I, I do this kind of thing. Um, I start with fundamental theory and, and models, which are simply mathematical. These are implemented in uh, software, which calculates numerically the state of an electronic system in matter, molecules. Uh, I'll give you more examples later on. And um, I insist on, on this point, all of the software that we develop is open source. It's accessible to anyone in the world and it's used in India and China and US and so on, uh, extremely widely. Um, once we have implemented the equations and the, the theory that we want, to, we want to understand, we can explain cutting edge uh, experiments. This is an example from a, a neutron spectrum in which you can see continuous bands which represent waves of vibration within tin selenide. But there's also a little blob here, which is not explainable with standard theories. And this is the kind of thing that can emerge from uh, this type of calculation. And once we've done this for a pristine material, we can go back and, and look at reality, confront this with experiments, confront this with industrial reality, and include further complexities, temperature, high pressure, extreme chemical environments with very high pH and so on. Um, once you get to this complexification stage, usually you need to go back and adapt your models and your fundamental theory. And so this is a kind of virtuous circle which goes back and, and forth. Okay, in a very small nutshell, I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with these, uh, with these techniques. Um, I start with uh, matter, simply CO molecule here, and I want to solve in principle Schrodinger's equation, which looks extremely simple, but is actually extremely complex as soon as you go to a large number of degrees of freedom for the, the, the quantum wave function here. Once I've done this, um, I can calculate all kinds of, of quantities, physical quantities, chemical quantities, structural, uh, thermodynamics, and so on. All the degrees of freedom of the system are in principle embedded within this, this quantum wave function here. And the way I'm going to do that is using what's known as density functional theory which showed since the 1960s that this problem can actually be summarized as a function of only the density, the density of states, sorry, the, the density of electrons here around the CO molecule is an extremely simple quantity. It's just one scalar at one point in, in space. And this is an exponentially simpler object than this one, but it was shown that this is sufficient to determine entirely the energy and therefore the, the whole of this, uh, of this state. Applications have abounded. This has become a very, very common tool. Almost all nature papers now are obliged to come to us and, uh, and, and have a, a numerical simulation component, which allows you to explain different things, but it also allows you to predict. So this is one example of a room temperature superconductor, almost room temperature. What I'm showing you here is like 20 degrees below zero Celsius. And it was predicted first in theory and then realized a few years later in experiment. And you may have seen uh, last year, they went even further to a superconductor, which is similar to this one. It has some added sulfur and, high, and, and carbon, but it goes to above room temperature, which is absolutely mind boggling to me. Um, in industry now, this is an example from Intel from about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, the choice of materials is guided by simulations using density functional theory. 
um, batteries and all kinds of, uh, of, of energy materials I mentioned before. And this is another example which uh, is very close to my heart because it was kind of reaching out to a different community. Geophysicists are really desperate for this kind of, of input because they have such extreme conditions in the center of the Earth, Jupiter, neutron stars and so on. Matter is in really different conditions there. And we were able to explain the resistivity of the iron at the center of the Earth and show that it had very different properties from what was expected in models from the 1980s. And so this, this completely changed the field in a sense because we revised very, very fundamental uh, tabulated energies and, and, and data which was used by almost everybody. Okay, that concerns the ground state of my system, my CO molecule with its uh, def default uh, uh, electron density. But if I were to perturb this, then I, I, I access all kinds of new uh, physical observables. So this is one example with uh, the electronic, the connection states of diamond as a function of temperature, and you can see them evolving. And we've shown th this year that uh, actually the, the interaction of the electrons with the vibrations of the diamond itself lead to a completely different picture. And this we hope is something that they can see experimentally. I, I don't know if you can you can see the difference here. The width of this line is is massively different, but also its shift from this uh, this baseline is is much much bigger. It's two or three times larger than than what was expected. In this way, we can access all kinds of spectroscopies, from gigahertz, uh, infrared, and so on up to X-rays. You can also do real-time dynamics to examine processes that happen on femtoseconds or even attosecond timescales, which was really not possible before, but is now accessible experimentally as well. So there's really a, a, a meeting of the two between experiment and, and theory there. Um, transport phenomena and so on. Mm. Yo. I do all of this within an organization that's called the European Theoretical Spectroscopy Facility. It's a network of theoretical physicists, chemists, material scientists, who work on the development of methods and software and codes. And this is started in, in, the, in Europe. So we have a, a now a burgeoning about 250 different, uh, different researchers within some 80 research groups, but when we've extended into the US as well. There's three, four uh, groups there as well. And we have privileged links with specific synchrotrons who host some of our scientists. And we, we go there to meet uh, experimentalists and, and uh, the users of these facilities. <clears throat> Okay, I'll come back just briefly to this aspect of open source uh, science. It's extremely important to me and from the beginning of my PhD, this has been a, a common thread. It has really changed the field because, uh, I mean, it's, this is the, the software package which I developed the most, uh, was one of the first to go open source. So in the same sense as Linux, it, it, everything is, is accessible and, and online and so on. Um, we have some, some number of developers, but uh, many thousands of users, thanks to this open source approach. And this pushed many of the other codes and the other software in the field to also go open source. And it has really exploded the number of people who have do, are doing these, these simulations, in particular in, in developing countries uh, where more experimental uh, science is, is really not accessible. They can do cutting edge research with just a laptop using this kind of code. Number of other pro uh, projects in this in this vein, and in particular the Siesta code, which I'll be using in the second example, I'll, I'll show you later. Okay, I won't go through all these details. Uh, suffice it to say that this, this also interfaces with online databases containing a large amount of experimental and uh, theoretical data, which can be confronted and, and used uh, dynamically online. Okay, the physics I'll be showing you is at the frontier between the action of electrons, charges within matter, and phonons, so the vibrations of, of atoms around their equilibrium position. And the interaction between this explains basically 80 or 90 percent of solid state physics. And using this, we do spectroscopy. This is an example of a, a spectrum of, of graphene, which gives this band here, and a hexagonal boron nitride, which gives this other one here. And the interaction between the two adds additional features down in, in this region. Uh, we do transport, transport of heat, transport of magnetization, transport of charge, um, the behavior of defects. Here you can see a silicon defect which is moving around in a hexagon here. This is actually controlled through an electron beam which is hitting on the atom next to the silicon. You can choose which direction it goes and where it's going to flip inside the carbon matrix. It's really amazing. 
we work a lot with synchrotrons, neutrons, large uh, light sources, also ultra fast ones like uh, free electron lasers. And uh, this, this has incidences for microscopy. This is an example of a scanning tunneling microscope, but also uh, electron uh, transmission, electron microscopy, SAM, and so on. OK. All of this has uh, applications to any material you, you want. I'll be showing you two cases which mix these, these three themes. So uh, a bit of spectroscopy, some transport, and in particular, the, the role of defects. OK. So my first example is the calculation of the ab initio uh, defect photoluminescence in, uh, in a specific case of, of hexagonal boron nitride. So just a little bit of, of perspective on the use of uh, different types of, of platforms to do quantum computing. So you've heard, probably heard about this, but um, qubit platforms for, for quantum computing have come in a huge variety of different, uh, different formats. The most popular one right now are superconducting flux qubits. So these are tiny little circuits with uh, rings that contain a certain amount of magnetic flux. And by using these, you can prepare them in different quantum states and couple them to other rings which are nearby but on microscopic distances. Um, this implies huge cryostats, extremely complex electronics like what you see here. And finally, the, the, the actual superconducting qubits are only this little chip in the middle. Um, this is extremely expensive, but it's uh, the, the most popular technology right now, which has scaled the most for true quantum computations. People do this with cold atoms, quantum dots, many other platforms. The one I'm going to be interested in most is that of solid state defects. So solid materials in which we create in a controlled way a defect. The state of the defect is going to couple to other defects nearby, and you can couple them in, in a quantum way. Why am I studying this in particular? because I believe it's the most scalable uh, technology for, for quantum computing. Um, th this is extremely complex and extremely costly. It goes to a, a, a unbelievably low temperatures in order to function. Um, that's not really something you can put on everyone's desktop, whereas potentially these types of, of qubits are. So the real question right now for quantum computing is how to scale up and how to integrate this. The other advantage of solid state materials is that many of these defects qubits are going to be integrated directly with silicon technology. And so you can put them in normal computers in a fairly seamless manner. This graph shows you the increase, very optimistic kind of uh, Moore's law increase in the number of qubits which have been integrated successfully in a single quantum computation. So we go from you know two, three, five qubits to present day, we're around 50 to 100, which is already quite impressive. And they've demonstrated quantum supremacy so that the fact that these computers can do things that no quantum, no classical computer could ever do in the space of, uh, of time that we have on, on Earth. Um, but they're, they're really a, a, quite optimistic in my, in, in my opinion, uh, going up to these uh, thousands of qubits, which would be necessary to really crack encryption or, 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 or break all kinds of other technological barriers. Okay. Solid state qubits have uh, a number of different flavors as well. The ones which are, are known most widely are, are phosphorus atoms embedded in silicon, the NV center in diamond or in silicon carbide. There are a number of others, but I will be interested in particular in 2D materials uh, because they have very specific advantages for these systems. The energy separation between different states is increased because of the 2D confinement of these, of these defects. Um, they're, because of this energy separation, they're also protected thermally. So the, the thermal excitations, even if you go to higher temperatures, are going to be uh, less of a, of a problem. The fabrication is much easier than what I showed you on the previous slide, because 2D materials can be assembled quite, uh, quite easily simply by, by heterostructuring them. Um, one big question is whether they can be addressed, whether they have the right energy separations to be addressed with full luminescence. And that's what we looked at in, in, this, uh, in this work. In the past two years, we've had uh, success looking at photoluminescence on one side. This is a work by, by Pedro who's here with us today. And um, uh, also looking at defects, but not so much for the luminescence, which is necessary. You need to get a photon out to read the state of your, your quantum computer. But um, mixing this large system with uh, this complex calculation is something we had not yet uh, attempted. And so we're going to do it on uh, a vacancy in boron nitride. Boron nitride is an extremely simple material. It has a, a huge electronic band gap, so it's completely transparent to in, in the visual. 
and we're going to charge this with an extra electron that sits in the vacancy left behind by ripping out a boron atom. And experimentally, this has been done, and they have a, uh, a photoluminescent spectrum which shows one uh, main peak around this uh, 800 to 900 nanometers. Okay, great. So it looks like it works, and uh, we want to first calculate it and see if we, if we can explain anything that's going on. This is the PhD work of Francesco Libbi, who's in, uh, in, in EPFL in Switzerland. And he started by calculating the different states of the spin down and the spin up electrons inside the, the defect. And you can see that there are a number of states which appear, many here, and only one of them is empty, but this is basically perfect for a qubit. You can start by preparing the states which are down here, and then you photo excite them up into the upper level, and eventually you can read it out as it re-emits a photon going from up here down to down here. The trouble is that if you look at the absorption of light by these different transitions between the different levels for the electrons down here and the empty state up here, uh, you find very little. This is the, the bulk of HBN, and here is the case with a defect. You can see that there's almost nothing. There's almost no light which is absorbed by the system. And uh, we explain this because the, the first peak is actually symmetry forbidden, so that's gone. The second peak has an out-of-plane dipole. If you imagine a 2D material, um, the, the, by, by moving charge vertically, you're going to get a very, very small electrical dipole. And so that, that explains why this peak is so small. And the third one has an in-plane dipole, which is going to be much larger, but it's still quite a, quite a small peak. And it's, it's much higher up than what they see experimentally. Um, so the next step we did was to actually populate the state which is probably seen by the photoluminescence experiments. Photoluminescence experiments are continuous, and so you keep pumping a laser onto the system. It keeps exciting electrons up into this state, and then they keep on going up and down. And this, this occupation of the, the top state and the emptying of the bottom states is going to change things. We didn't think it would change things this much, but the different states are pushed down. You can see the gray arrows, the, the, the defect uh, energy level are, are, uh, are completely re-modified. And now all of a sudden you get different transitions which are enabled because this state has some electrons, so we can emit light by going down from this state down to here, down to here, potentially even down to here. And now we have different transitions from the ones in the absorption spectrum I showed you in the previous slide. But we still have one which is uh, forbidden. This is the black one. And this is the one that they see experimentally. So what's, what's wrong? We, there's another transition which is lower in energy. This is actually the strongest one. Why don't they see this one experimentally? So something really weird is going on. And if you actually look at the total, this is intensity here is normalized to one. But if you look at the total intensity, it's actually extremely low for this system. Um, the, this out of plane I mentioned before is, is for geometric reasons, it's, it's basically, it's ridiculous. It's very low intensity. So chemical intuition will tell you this is a, a charge system with a defect. It's probably going to distort. And this is known as a Jan Teller distortion. And indeed it does. If you, if you push it slightly, it, it distorts into a, a lower energy configuration with this different uh, equilibrium geometry. But even if you do that, it almost doesn't change your, your spectrum of emission because the, the, the peaks go from down here to up here, but they're, they're still much lower than the, the other peaks around. We still don't have uh, an explanation. This is the mechanism that happens in almost all the other solid state qubit defects I mentioned before. Almost all of them undergo a Jan Teller distortion. So we expected this to, to, to occur and to explain things, but it doesn't. What does explain things is to look at the full interaction of this defect with all the vibrations of the atoms around it. If you take them all into account, this develops dynamically, right, as a function of time, in-plane electrical dipoles, which are hugely important. And if you take all the change of this absorption and the re-emission of light into account, the change due to the vibrations with first neighbor atoms and second neighbor atoms and third neighbor atoms and so on. Um, in the end, all the other peaks stay at very low intensity. And this peak, which was forbidden previously, is now enabled. Why? Because the, the dynamical motion of the atoms is breaking the symmetry locally and enables, it allows the absorption of light and the re-emission of light. And you can see we, we obtained really beautiful agreement with experiment. It has the same shape. 
within about 0.1 or 0.15 electron volts, we're at the same position. And if we align what's known as the zero phonon line, which is the, the, the down edge of, of this peak, um, you really have very, very similar structure. Okay. Um, there are different phonon modes. I won't go into any of the details, but it's interesting to see that the, these, these different shoulders here have different origins and their importance will vary as a function of temperature. At low temperature, you start with a, a peak down here, and as you go up to higher temperature, the Bose-Einstein distribution for the, the different vibrations is going to favor a, a peak up here, and this is also seen experimentally. Okay, take home message. We think that the charged boron vacancy in HBN is an extremely good qubit candidate. Um, we've shown that uh, there is uh, broken symmetry which is needed for photoluminescence, but it's not the standard Jan Teller mechanism which was expected and has been studied in the literature before. Uh, you really need to go and populate all the vibrational modes around it, and that gives you a very strong temperature dependence. The mode weight between the different vibrations is, is, time, is temperature dependent. And this also makes it uh, an interesting nanothermometer. This was observed last year by this experimental work by Chen. Um, and we get a, a very similar uh, kind of slope, a change of, of the width of this uh, emission peak as a function of temperature. It allows you on a nanometer scale to measure the temperature to within a, a, few, a few Kelvin. It's quite impressive. Okay. I'll skip the other way. So I've dealt with computing. I, I want to go back a, a, a step and, and deal with something more related to energy efficiency and, and, and energy management. In particular, nanoscale thermal transport. So all these devices on, on the nanoscale uh, have to be somehow managed. This is an example from 2011. This was actually made, it's not to scale, but it's a, a very impressive proof of concept they put one 2D material here in the middle on top of uh, sil uh, silicon oxide, contacted it with uh, source and drain, and they made a transistor out of basically an atomically thin layer of molybdenum disulfide. There are strong advantages to doing this in, in 2D because this dimension here is very small. You need a very small electric field to actually turn the transistor on and off. And this makes all the difference for the power consumption of your, your CPU. Um, the fact that you're using extremely low amount of mass here, you need a substrate, but the amount of active material here is, is very small, and so potentially you're going to be much more resource efficient as well. Okay, but here heating is, is really critical. If you have too much heat, the, the material is so small, and there's such a small volume that it's going to evaporate or, or destroy the, the circuit. This can also be an advantage because many of these materials actually have thermoelectric activity, and you can use them to harvest waste heat if in the process here, for example, in, in the ohmic contacts behind your 2D material, you're generating some heat. It is possible to extract some of this heat as useful work because it drives a current of charge through the material due to the Zeebeck effect. Um, this in, sh should allow for things like autonomous sensing and Internet of Things, all these devices which we should be wearing on our bodies and throughout our homes in the coming decades uh, have to be powered somehow, and powering them with a cord is really not an option. So you need some autonomous generation of power, and this is, this is one serious option. The other advantage here would be what, what's called active cooling. So if you use this in re reverse and run the electrical current in the other direction, it actually cools the central material, and this allows you to cool the, the substrate if you slap this on top of a, of a CPU or another device which has to be maintained at low temperature, um, this, this is one of the most robust ways to do it. It's something that lasts, for example, on the Voyager probes, which have been going since I was born, basically, and are outside the solar system. These things still work, not because of photovoltaics, because they're way too far from the sun. They have absolutely no solar uh, throughput anymore, but because of uh, a, a core of uranium oxide, or plutonium, depends, uh, which is irradiating one of these thermoelectric uh, devices, and it's been going for, for 40 years straight. Anyways, um, this is a, a field which is important to the, the, the 2D electronics. Um, in, within 2D electronics, one of the most uh, serious contenders is this uh, molybdenum sulfide I, I showed you in the previous slide, and the whole family of transition metal dichalcogenides. They have uh, good gaps. They're good optoelectronic materials for different reasons I won't go into here. Um, but they have 
very decent mobility is comparable to the best silicon that you can buy on the market right now, the most crystalline stuff, but they're much cheaper to produce. Um, but what about uh, thermal conductivity? And so if you look at the literature since last year, it, it looks horrible. There's a huge spread of values over more than an order of magnitude. If you go down to nano-scaled uh, transition metal dichalcogenides, the bulk, everyone kind of agrees, is between 30 and 40 watts per meter per Kelvin. But if you go down and thin this layer down below you know, 10 layers of MOS2, some papers say it goes down, other papers say it goes up, and some papers say it goes down, but just a little bit, or it's completely random. Um, and so our, our collaborators in, in Barcelona, in particular, Klasian Tilroy, uh, started looking at, at this in, in much more detail a few years ago, and they, they discovered a number of, uh, of surprises. So what do they do? They take this uh, layer of molybdenum selenide in this case, and they're going to shine two lasers on it, one from the top and one from the bottom. One of the lasers is going to heat the central part of the 2D material, and this heat is going to spread. And the bottom laser is going to come in with a much lower intensity and simply probe a specific vibration of the molybdenum selenide. And this vibration has a frequency which is very sensitive to temperature. So this is a thermometer. The bottom laser is a thermometer. The top one is a, is a heater. And as the heat spreads, you're going to get a, an equilibrium distribution of, of heat through it. And you're going to arrive at a temperature. If you go back and make a, a model for the heat spreading through this 2D layer, you can extract the, the, the effective speed of uh, thermal conduct conduction through this 2D layer. OK. These two plots simply show you that by increasing the temperature and observing the thermometer, or by increasing the power and observing the thermometer, you get the same thing. Your, your, your peak here for the vibration is going to move in the same way whether you're increasing the power of your laser or whether you're increasing the, the, the base temperature of your system. So it is a reliable thermometer. What took them two years is that there's a huge number of artifacts in the literature. And this explains the spread I showed you in the previous slide. Um, the first one is that you, you need to do this measurement on top of a, a membrane, which has a hole here through which you can actually access your, your sample. And uh, this, uh, this substrate is, is very important. Most people use either silicon or silicon nitride. Fine, it's sufficiently rigid. It allows you to deposit your 2D material. Everything is, uh, is, is hunky-dory. But if you do this, the silicon nitride is actually not conducting enough it doesn't absorb all the heat, and so you, you get a Gauss in here, which is much, much broader than the hole that you think you're looking at. Second artifact, if you use so, a hole which is too small, and too small means one micron, which is massive by nanoscopic uh, criteria. Um, if, if you use a hole that's too small, you don't actually get the full spreading of the heat. You get it uh, truncated by the size of the, of the hole in your membrane. Second artifact. Third artifact, they were able to get rid of the effect of the silicon nitride by using uh, gold-coated silicon nitride. The gold is much more conducting. It absorbs all the heat here at the interface, and you can really pretend that the heat spreading is only happening within the, 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 the hole that you're, you're doing. OK. We've submitted the, the, the paper. We think that 50% of the, of the articles I, I just showed you in the previous slide are, are probably wrong in a way. And the last and, and worst thing about this is that if you don't do this in vacuum, you get completely random results. If you don't use ultra high vacuum, a lot of the heat that you think you're pumping into the 2D material actually goes out into the air above. There's a kind of super convective effect and this, this heat is carried out by the, the, the surrounding air extremely efficiently. This has been seen before in graphene, but this is the first time people have seen it in, in transitional metal type halcogenides. Sorry. So here we came. This is uh, Roberta, who uh, did, is doing her, her postdoc on these materials. And she started out in, in, in a joint collaboration with, uh, with Klaasian, uh, calculating the thermal conductivity of, uh, of these materials. And we arrive at something which is actually quite close to their experimental data. And I don't know if you can appreciate this from there. This is really boring. <laughs> There's nothing happening at nanoscale. You go down to one layer of MOSE2, and nothing's happening. There's neither an increase nor a decrease. The change with respect to the bulk value up here 
is uh, you know maybe a factor of two at, at most. But our calculations agree. Um, so comparing to, to this with an order of magnitude here, it's, uh, it, it was quite a surprise. How do we do this? We calculate the thermal conductivity from a density functional theory I mentioned before. We start with a big box of atoms and then you shake it and you displace all the atoms. And then you look at the forces which are restoring these atoms to their equilibrium positions. And you can fit these forces and pretend that they come from springs, maybe ideal springs, which are purely harmonic, or more realistic springs, which are a bit anharmonic. And once you've done that, this is called the temperature-dependent effective potential method. You can go back and calculate the frequency of each of the vibrational modes as a function of temperature. You can calculate its lifetime, how long this vibration lasts before it decays into other vibrational modes, and you can calculate the thermal conductivity. Our conclusion at the end of this is that we really need not 3D quantities like this thermal conductivity here. We need something that is adapted to a, a, a bidimensional system. And that's, that's far from trivial, but we think we have something in that, uh, in that direction. So why does the thermal conductivity saturate at low, uh, at, at low thic thickness here? Um, next surprise that came out of Roberta's work is that uh, there's actually a compensation. This is what we call the spectral thermal conductivity. So it's how much each of the vibrational modes is contributing to the total thermal transport. And as you thin, so that's going from blue down to yellow, as you thin, the higher frequency modes around one terahertz, which everyone has always presumed do all of the transport of the heat, they decrease. So in principle, our thermal conductivity should be going like that. But the low frequency modes down here, they increase and they completely compensate. That's why we, we, we level off in the, the total thermal conductivity. On the other side, we can plot this as a function of the wavelength of these different vibrations. So this is a, a vision in terms of the energy of the vibrations. This is in terms of the wavelength. And if you look at it, there's still some of the thermal conductivity up here, about 10 percent, which is uh, which is happening for wavelengths larger than 5, 10 micrometers. Micrometers is insanely large for this. This means that effectively, if you have a membrane with a hole that's smaller than that, there's some of the thermal conductivity that you're missing because these things are careening out ballistically from your, your central uh, heated spot. So there we go. At least some of the artifacts can be explained entirely on the basis of this nice microscopic picture from, from a, a bulk thermal conductivity. Okay. Take away for the, the, the thermal transport. Uh, I hope that we've established a, a kind of yeah, a protocol for a clean calculation of thermal conductivity in a 2D material. I think this is extremely important for the, for the field. What's really interesting is this super convection effect. Uh, as I mentioned, it's been seen in other 2D materials, but it's actually an advantage. If what you want is to spread the heat quickly and to cool your system, using the air on top of it uh, is, is actually an, an advantage, a very strong advantage here. Um, our, our theory agrees very well with the experimental values that have been found at, at, at low thickness. Um, and we've been able to explain a number of the artifacts they see based on the microscopic mechanisms in, in the sample. This is under review. I wanted to thank some of the people, this is not all the team, but some of the people who've worked on the thermal conductivity I just mentioned here, uh, Klaus Jan and his team in uh, ICN2 in, in Barcelona. This is Ulla Hellman, who does not show up on internet anywhere. He's working in, in Linköping in Sweden. Uh, Pedro, you know, and the, the, the team in EPFL who've been working on the, the boron nitride vacancies. So just to leave you with a, a little bit of vision for the future, um, I think at this stage I've established some of the usefulness of uh, this, this uh, density functional theory. But it's, it's an engine that can serve in many, many different purposes. And some of the, the ways this will happen in the future is going through high throughput calculations with millions of different calculations on different compounds in different conditions, thermodynamic conditions, environmental conditions, and so on. And on top of that, using machine learning uh, to be able to you know, log a, a huge amount of, of information and extract real knowledge about materials and about their, their variability. You can also use the same engine inside a different car and go for very complex environments. 
introduce defects, introduce uh, external electrochemistry and all, all kinds of other, other conditions. Or you can do completely different stuff, like Elon Musk, you know, ejecting his car into, into space. And this is, this is part of what motivates me the most in looking for uh, novel physics and, and exploring it, implementing it, and then applying for, for new types of experiments. Thank you very much for having me, and I'd be happy to take any questions.